Glenn, I, I never quite know what, what he's going to say. i got to mix it up, Dan. got to mix it up. <laughs> but it's always good. You know, when I hear that, I think, dang, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, it's true. We did ride our bike across the United States. Imagine what I could have done with a car. <laughs> uh, so, my name's Dan Bowman, and uh, I'm with the bank, and been here for 23 years. We started the bank, it started on my dining room table on Christmas Day, 1998. Uh, started writing a business plan for a commercial bank in Chino. And uh, at that time, the, the larger banks were consolidating, as they still are consolidating today. And uh, with larger banks, they tend to work pretty well for consumers, um, not as well for medium-sized businesses. Big businesses, you know, General Motors they're good at, or consumers they're good at, it's the in-between where uh, we thought we could do some improvements. So we put a group together, we organized the bank, sold stock. Uh, Bernie Wolfswinkle, you may, some of you know Bernie. Great guy. Uh, Bernie is 92, and he still continues today to be our chairman of the board. Uh, Bernie will always be our chairman, um, one way or another. He, he can't make it to board meetings now, but uh, we do it virtually, and uh, he's a, a great chairman, great board member, great supporter. Anyway, we, we sold stock to probably a lot of folks in this room, and uh, I'm pleased to say it's up about 550% off that original price. So um, that worked well. If it weren't up 550%, I wouldn't be here. So <laughs> I wouldn't bring it up. I talk about that now. Uh, it's been a good investment and done real well. It's a great community and a great time. And, and our basic values are just treat it like it's real money and like we'd like to get it back. And Let's not get too wound up over policies and that sort of thing, but if it makes good sense, if it makes good business sense, maybe we can do it. And uh, that seems to appeal to a lot of small business people. So anyway, we've got about 1,400 small businesses that bank with us, or 1,400 small businesses that have accounts. I don't think it's that many small businesses. But um, times are pretty good, and except for every talking head on Fox News, CNN, and MSNBC, and EIEIO. Uh, yikes, everybody's an expert. It kind of gives you the impression that, you know, if a tree fell on somebody, there'd, there'd be a guy on Fox News say, oh my god, trees are going to kill us all. You steward the trees. The trees will wipe us all out. Yeah. Come on. I was listening to a guy the other day, I, you know, I get up early and I go, Abbott cyclist no more, Abbott on the stationary bike now. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm watching this thing, making myself crazy, and the guy's saying, you know, oh, little banks, oh, they're going to be wiped out. There's 4,300 community banks in this country, not counting credit unions. And in one sentence, you can sum them all up. That's pretty good. That's like saying everybody's tall or everybody's short. Or, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. But, Anyway, I'm screaming at a television. <laughs> so what's up in the banking business? So it, by the way, before I forget about this, in, in case somebody got invited and said, small business roundtable, what's that all about? What are you guys doing? You're going to sell me something. i got to buy a timeshare, I know. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's true. You can buy a timeshare, but not from us. Um, so we, we get together, prior to the pandemic, we try to do this quarterly, and we would try to limit it to about 50 people, and people who own or ran or managed a business of some kind or in the business arena, and uh, we'd sit down and we'd just talk, and we would get somebody who hopefully was knowledgeable on the subject, and uh, let's just kind of talk about what's going on. Let's do some networking, let's collect some business cards, maybe we can meet some people that are helpful to us. And maybe we'll learn something. Who knows? If nothing else, you get chicken nuggets for free. So. <laughs> so what is up with banking? Silicon Valley Bank. That, that bank caused me a lot of grief. Uh, First Republic, they dodged the ball on that one. They got uh, the Treasury Department invited 11 banks to sit around a boardroom and clock the door and said, don't come out until you got a solution. So they all pulled the money on the table and saved First Republic. Uh, Signature Bank. Uh, Signature Bank was seized on a Sunday. Who does that? 
I think the Bible says don't seize banks on Sunday. I'm pretty sure about that one. But uh, yeah, seized on a Sunday. Uh, Credit Suisse, that is the second largest bank in Switzerland. This is a country, you know, fair number of banks here. The second largest bank failed, uh, was taken over um, in a structured deal with the Swiss government. And then uh, Silvergate, now Silvergate's interesting. It didn't fail, it hasn't failed, but it's an orderly liquidation. They're winding that bank down. And uh, that's kind of interesting. So what? What in the world is going on in the banking business? So I thought, let's, let's focus on one of them, because there are different stories on each one, but Silicon Valley, I think, may be helpful to us, helpful to understand what's going on. So Silicon Valley Bank, I sat next to their president at the Federal Reserve for three years. Really a good guy, decent guy. He's retired for about huh, four or five years now, so he's not around for this debacle. But uh, a good banker and a good guy, and I hate to see this happen. And honestly, if I were to make a list of banks that I thought might you know, hit the rocks, this wouldn't have been on the top of the list. Because historically, it hasn't been a bad bank. So what happened? And by the way, I'll, I'll give you an advance warning. You know, Usually, the guys that do this, they give you a bunch of small stuff that says, don't sue me if I say something wrong. Well, I'm not going to do that. But what I am going to tell you is, I get really geeky here. So you'll, you'll become an expert on bank balance sheet distribution allocation. So anyway, so banking, the, uh, the primary risk, really the big one is credit risk. Credit risk is what historically has hurt banks to the point that they don't survive. The other risk, of course, is interest rate risk. Well, that's just kind of common sense. You make a loan at five and interest rates go to seven and now you're upside down and you're in trouble. That's what happened to the savings and loan industry. They took CDs at an average rate of about three and a half percent and they made six and a quarter percent 30 year fixed rate mortgages and life was really good until they started paying 18 percent, about 15 and a half percent on CDs. And they were upside down and uh, wiped out the industry. The, the whole savings and loan industry, the FSLIC, Fail. It was absorbed into the FDIC. It's because of interest rate risk. And then the other is liquidity risk. What liquidity risk is talking about is, is people that show up at your teller line and politely say, I'd like to get all my money out of here. And uh, if too many of them show up, then you've got a scene out of It's a Wonderful Life when Jimmy Stewart is there and has to take his money from the wedding and pay him out. That was me this last week. <laughs> so um, this is a, a typical bank balance sheet. So uh, about 80% of a typical bank balance sheet are loans. Makes sense. 80% loan to deposit ratio. Uh, not uncommon. Some go all the way to 100. I've seen some at 140%. Man, they're way over their skis. Typical is about 80. And then you've got investments. These are something like mortgage-backed securities or treasuries, something like that. And then you've got fixed assets. Fixed assets are the vault, the chairs, the desks, that sort of thing. And then you've got a little bit of cash, about 3% in cash. That's vault cash and that sort of thing in transit. And then other is a variety of different things uh, here and there. So that's the basic bank. And you know, they, maybe this will go to 82 percent or 79, something like that. Okay, fine. But the key thing in our discussion here is investments. Investments typically around 10 percent. It's not a huge percentage of the bank's total balance sheet. Okay. So this is where we start to get geeky in bond valuations. You guys are going to have a PhD in economics here, real quick. So if we look at the valuation of a bond the income and the duration are contractual. So in our example here, we've got a bond that's paying $2,000 a year for X number of years, and then the principal at the end. Okay, fine. Well, if you divide that by 2%, that'll give you the maximum you can pay for that bond if you want a 2% rate of return, right? Makes sense, $2,000 a year, 2%, $100,000, okay, that, that works. Got it, pretty easy. So far, so good. But what if this interest rate goes to two and a half? Then what do you do? 
Well, at two and a half, two thousand dollars per year by X number of years is only worth eight. Okay. So what we can see is as interest rates move higher, bond valuations move lower. Right? They, they move in opposite directions to each other. Okay. In this particular example, it's a 20% volatility of what we call 50 basis points or bips. And that's one hundredths of one percent. So 50 bips is a half a percent. So in this case, 20% volatility of 50 bips. Okay, so far so good. We're, we're all right. Now then, we've got accounting to do with this. Now, accounting comes in two varieties, hold to maturity and available for sale. So think about hold to maturity is like my house. What I mean by that is, okay, I got my house and the values in the neighborhood go up or they go down or they do whatever. It's just kind of amusing to me. I'm not, I'm not gonna sell or not sell based upon that value. It's just because I'm living in my house. And available for sale is a house I've listed and I'm offering on the market. Now that one I'm very interested in the sale in the competitive market prices. What is it selling for? because I'm offering it for sale. And so we account for these investments, either hold to maturity, I'm gonna keep it for the next 30 years, or available for sale, I'm gonna pull the ripcord in a minute and get out of this thing. So as you can imagine, if I were to be accounting for my house, if I were to put it in hold to maturity, that says I'm not gonna sell this house for 30 years, I'm gonna keep it. Well, that seems kind of risky. I might decide I wanna move sometime during that 30 years. So I'll keep it an available for sale to give me options. And that's why many securities end up in available for sale. The challenge with available for sale accounting is you've got to adjust it for market value. Remember I talked about it, if I bought it at 100 or it was worth 100 and now it's worth 80? It means available for sale. I've got to mark this down on my balance sheet to 80. Oh shoot, that's no fun. Um, Versus hold to maturity, I don't have to mark it to mark. Okay. So I've got 20% volatility, but keep in mind that's on a 10% asset class, right? 20% volatility, 10% asset class, that's only 2% on total assets. Well, okay, all right. It's, it's big volatility on a small investment, so it's not that, it's not gonna kill me. All right, good. Typically, a bank's uh, assets and capital are about 90% in total assets, 10% in capital. Okay, makes sense. I've got 2% asset volatility on 10% capital, which means 20% volatility on capital. You with me so far? All right, rates go up, my capital drops by a fifth of 20%. Okay, good. And it turns my 10% capital in that example to an 8% capital. Well, I'm not happy about it, but it's okay. I can survive that. All right. So let me switch now to market forces that are at work here. And this is the Federal Reserve Bank's total assets. Okay. So you ever wonder who controls all the number of dollars there are in the world? It's the Federal Reserve. <laughs> and they, we used to say they printed money. They don't even need to print money now. It's a keystroke. Ooh, there you go. Another trillion dollars. Well, this line goes back to, I think, 2001 or two, or something like that, and it goes all the way back to 1947. <coughs> the Federal Reserve balance sheet was below a trillion dollars. This is $893 billion, right? Sounds like a lot of money, but by Federal Reserve standards, not so much. And it was very low and very stable and everything else. And in 2009, a guy named Ben Bernanke said, we see a little bit of foam in the system. And Ben Bernanke figured out, hey, I've got a checkbook. I can write money here, hot dog. And the Fed went crazy. So at this point, we were less than a trillion dollars. We started, we went over a, a $2 trillion right off the bat in order to save the economy, but then we just couldn't seem to stop. And we went here for a period, now 2013 through 2019, those were good years, they were boom years. The Fed kept expanding the balance sheet, so they were expanding the number of dollars in circulation. And they were buying mortgage-backed securities with that. Okay, fine. 
So by 2019, we were up to $3.7 trillion. So we had gone from one trillion to 3.7 trillion in arguably what was really pretty good times. And then the pandemic hit. And the pandemic was, after all, it's an emergency, we can do anything and nobody will say anything. And so we printed money to the point of $8.9 trillion. So in a period from 2009 to 2020, end of 21, we increased by $7.9 trillion, or 800% in the total of dollars in circulation. Now I'll get back to that balance sheet point in a minute. I just want to illustrate what the Fed has done. And by the way, these are their numbers. FRED stands for Federal Reserve Economic Data. So I'm not making up these numbers. I got them from them. So we have dramatically increased the number of dollars in circulation. Okay. In this particular case, in just the past two years, we've increased by 5.2 trillion or 140%. This chart shows total bank deposits. We can see total bank deposits fairly steady and increasing, go all the way back to 2008 until we got to the pandemic. And there we went from 13 trillion to 18 trillion, or 5 trillion in total bank deposits. Okay? And it makes sense. The Fed prints a bunch of money. It eventually gets into private sector's deposits, which get into bank deposits. Okay, fine. We see that. And ARBIC here, in 2020, we had an increase in deposits of 42%. That's a lot. Followed by 28%. Followed by 12%. Any one of those is a gigantic increase in total deposits for the bank. And the whole industry experienced that. So as a net result, the typical bank balance sheet, the cash, remember that cash was 3%? It ballooned up to 33%. It was huge. Everybody was full of cash. And it had no value. The overnight Fed funds rate was eight basis points. That's eight one hundredths of 1%. And cash was worth nothing. Uh, nobody was paying anything on CDs. Nobody was paying anything on money market accounts. You name it, nobody was paying anything on it. Good news is you could borrow super cheap. Bad news is if you were a depositor, you couldn't get much of a return. And that was the environment that we were in at that time. And the problem is, banks aren't designed to sit on a whole pile of cash. We like to put it to work. We like to invest it somewhere. And so eventually, the banks began to invest that cash into investments. Now, they didn't do dumb investments. They bought things like US Treasuries. OK, that's uh, full faith and credit of the federal government. So it's a pretty safe investment. It's considered to be equal to cash, zero risk weighted. Um, that's a fair investment. OK, so they tanked up on investments, 40% of the total balance sheet now. Silicon Valley Bank went a step further. They were at 56% of their total assets in investments. The problem is, remember that 20% volatility example we used? 20% volatility on 56% of your total assets equates into an 11.2% volatility on your total assets. So to look at it a different way, 90% assets, 10% capital, now I deduct 11.2, I'm a negative tangible net equity. And that's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. They bought US Treasuries. 56% of the portfolio is US Treasuries. This is a tweet from one of their shareholders on January 18. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank hold to mark maturity securities had a mark-to-market loss in the third quarter of 15.9 billion compared to 11.5 billion of tangible common equity. So what they're saying here is there's a negative tangible common equity there of about $4 billion. <clears throat> Luckily, regulators don't force Silicon Valley to mark to market the securities, but
but the bank would be functionally underwater if it were liquidated today. This is what one of their shareholders was tweeting to other shareholders. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag plan to sell. Ow. Talk about your basic nightmare. In addition to that, Silicon Valley Bank uniquely, uh, they banked a lot of fintech companies. <coughs> they were up, as you would imagine, in Silicon Valley. This is where Apple and Microsoft and everybody's located and they're doing a lot of startups. And so they had a relatively small number of depositors with very big deposits. Their largest depositor was $10 billion. Just that one depositor, if he'd have gotten mad and gone to Wells Fargo, would have wreck that ship, let alone more than one. So let's look at the Federal Reserve now. <clears throat> this is the Fed Fund's effective rate. Now the Fed Fund's, you hear um, uh, Jerome Powell comes out on Wednesday following the Tuesday Open Market Committee and he gives very detailed scripted messages regarding the market and the plans, etc. So, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, back here in 05, 06, ramped up to about 5.5% and then dropped. And then went for seven years at basically 0%. Now, I was around during that time. There were some good times. It wasn't all crisis and desperation. But we kept this at zero because we kept trying to push inflation. When I was on the Fed board, there was a lot of discussion. The, the challenge for the Fed at that time was deflation. The Fed hates deflation. Why do you hate deflation? Because it hurts borrowers. It favors savers, but it hurts borrowers. Who's the biggest borrower? The U.S. government. So deflation is where my money becomes more and more valuable because there's less of it around. Inflation is where it becomes less and less valuable. So keep in mind, if I borrowed 100 and I go on an inflationary period, now that 100 becomes more like 50 or 40 or 30. You know? Deflation, I borrow 100, it becomes 150, 180, 200. It becomes harder to pay it back. So the Fed kept trying to push inflation, and we can see that here. We went through a long time here without an increase in interest rate, trying to press this thing. We had a little bit of an increase here, 16 through about 19. And then we went for <clears throat> 20 to 22 at eight basis points, pretty close to zero. And then we started shooting up. And the challenge here is the Fed historically has increased interest rates at about 25 basis points per adjustment, right? One quarter of 1%. This particular Fed jumped out there in a hurry and started doing 75 bips per. And nobody expected that. So what we saw was 500 basis point increase in 13 months. I'm, I'm lying, it's 492 basis points in 13 months. Nobody saw that coming. Nobody modeled that. Nobody planned for that. In fact, the message from the Fed was inflation is transitory. There's nothing to worry about. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Oh, yeah, listen to them. So Silicon Valley Bank had a volatile customer bank. Small number of depositors, very big deposits, very connected. They talked to each other. And 97% were above FDIC maximums. So virtually all of the deposits were above $250,000 per deposit. Abnormally high percentage of fixed income securities. 56% of their total balance sheet was in fixed income securities. And the U.S. Treasuries, they're safe. They've got to get paid. But that devaluation in a rising rate environment just killed them. Again, 97% exceeding FDIC limits. Well-connected depositor base. They tweet each other. Things like plan to sell. <laughs> and rapidly rising interest rates. It's the recipe for disaster for this particular bank. So what's next? Is everybody going to crash? <laughs> really got a question. Again. Yes, sir. If you had been in that seat where you have this very high number of, very high deposits, and 
your co your customers don't borrow money from you, which is exactly what their right. situation was. Right. How do you mitigate that risk? Now, what would you have done? Different. Oh, oh, well, I'd have seen it coming a long time in advance. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you where's your, where's your office? Someone check yes. the crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. And, you know, this is one of those things where you look back and you say, thanks God, that, that wasn't me. Because many of the things they did were not outrageous. This wasn't about bankers gone wild or anything like that. Uh, did they take a lot of risk? Yeah, they could have hedged that, by the way. Uh, they saved the money and didn't hedge it. Um, looking back, they wish they would have hedged it. Uh, there was a certain amount of bravado. I can get off on a rant about the wokeism of this particular group and how well they connected with one half of the <laughs> political spectrum. Go woke, go broke. That's about it. <laughs> so, uh, at any rate, and then, you know, your president sits on the governor's wife's nonprofit board, and it was just a little too close for things, and in my opinion, there might have been some assurances, some signals, some, eh, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. I'm speculating about all of that, of course. But, back to your question, would I have known better? Uh, I'm just glad I wasn't there. Why couldn't they get out of treasuries? Were they fixed? They were, sort of like they were fixed, fixed rate while they had to pay out more. The, the treasuries are always fixed. And keep in mind, remember my example there, you bought it at 100. Interest yeah, rates went up, and now it's worth 80. What, what is the period on a treasury? Depends. Uh, wait, so they bought, to get more income, they bought longer deals. Even if you only had seven or eight year treasuries, it, it still, there's the market volatility on the treasury. How fast the hmm? What's that? How fast the rates went up. How fast the rates went up, yes. Nobody anticipated 500 bips in 13 months. There was a bank, and, and, uh, 10 years ago, I remember what it was, but they you know, it's today, and I don't remember, but they just announced the, the, the bank was struggling because they had, they had made these loans that they thought were uh, advantageous. They'd make loans at interest rates at 2% interest only loans. They made it out to their, it was on the news. And now they're also have a problem in here. And what, who, I, I, I struggle with their leadership in making these loans, and they made a lot of them, at 2% fixed rate interest only loans. I'll go one better than that. How about $80 million worth of 1% PPP loans? Yeah. You did them. <laughs> a bunch of them. About 800 of them. And at 1%. Number one, we were strongly encouraged to do that. And we're in a crisis mode. These are fully insured, etc. We could cl collateralize and pledge them and hedge against them so we could protect ourselves against risk. But honestly, today... Yeah, those were what you made were <laughs> protected in some respect. We, we That's did. a different animal. Thank God I got <laughs> yeah. five left or something. I don't know. What is the number? It's five yeah, or six. It's about not, that. Not very many. Yeah. And uh, they're still at 1%. And those borrowers are never going to pay that thing. Of course, yeah. Uh, heck, they took that money and invested it in foreign quarters or something. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Treasury. Yeah, treasury. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> was it? Bitcoin. Ah, Bitcoin. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's got to come back. Yeah. Back. So, so what's next? I, you know, I've kind of painted this really tough thing. So what's next? Well, so as as we remember, Silicon Valley was raided, if you will, and the FDIC came in on Friday and took over the bank. And of course, the announcement went out, etc. And there was a lot of flap. And then the following Sunday, Signature Bank was closed, and then Monday Janet Yellen comes out and starts talking about systemically important, my ex-friend Janet Yellen. Um, but <laughs> by Tuesday, they came out with the Federal Reserve Bank Term Funding Program. This was a big deal. So keep in mind, the Federal Reserve is, was organized in 2000, I'm sorry, 1913, as the lender of last resort to the financial industry. And so here's an opportunity for them to step up and do what they were organized to do. And so they have this bank term funding program. And some of the interesting thing is you can borrow 100% of 
par value. So in my example there of 100, which is now worth 80, you could borrow 100. So if you bought that thing at 80, you could borrow its original par value. I could borrow more against the collateral than it cost me. Dude, good stuff. It's uh, fixed interest for 12 months. It's, uh, there's no prepayment penalty, so I can wash this out anytime I want. And it's the overnight swap plus 10 bips. This is cheap money. Mm -hmm. Super cheap money. And a lot of one phone call, $57 million. That's how easy it is to do it. Had this been around the previous week, Silicon Valley could have borrowed just about $190 billion. They could have met all their liquidity demands. Or a week late. So, so what about inflation rates? What about interest rates? What about what are we going to do here? Are rates going to go to the moon and stay there? Are they going to flatten out? What, what's going to happen? Well, number one, uh, despite what my previous friend said, inflation is not transitory at this time. And. Uh, of course, Janet Yellen came out early in the game and, and tried to calm people down. And in her defense, um, and Janet's not a bad person, she's a college professor, PhD college professor. Um, she takes kind of an academic approach to these things. And part of her challenge is she needs to calm the herd down, you know, on one hand, but yet give them reasonable guidance at the same time. And so if you said, oh my gosh, inflation's running off the rails, well then the market's going to overreact to it. So you say things like inflation is transitory when maybe we really don't think it is transitory. Because that's what you have to do to calm folks down. It's a tough job to be in, but as a net result, I'll recite things like inflation's not transitory. I'll make fun of it. Uh, <laughs> we see a little bit of foam in the system with Ben Bernanke. Um, so this is M2. Uh, there's what's called M1, M2, M3, and those are measurements of monetary supply. And that is uh, checking savings, money market, and CDs. M2. And we can see here, this goes all the way back to about 1960, and runs up and starts to accelerate, and then we get to the pandemic and it really goes berserk. But we saw that before with Fed's expansion. So we were at 15, a trillion in M2 at the beginning of the recession or uh, pandemic. We're at 22 trillion 18 months later. That's 46%, and I said two years, but I was being generous. It was really 18 months. So 46% expansion in M2. That's the amount of money in checking accounts. And it surprised them that we have inflation. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> what, what kind of academic uh, deal is she? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I know it. I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, any idiot should have been able to see that, don't you think? At least in the financial market. I don't know. I guess. Um, anyway, we're, we're missing something. So if, this is this is core CPI, and this is over that same time horizon, and core CPI. So this is the consumer price index. And what it does is it establishes a baseline, so a basket of goods and services cost X, and then it continues to measure that going forward, and it's either positive or negative. So CPI, and this, by the way, is core CPI. Core CPI takes out food and fuel. Food and fuel are volatile. And so the preferred reference is core CPI versus headline CPI. Headline CPI is quite a bit higher than this. If we put in food and fuel, as you can imagine, inflation's up quite a bit. So when the pandemic hit, inflation was right at about, well, no, I take it back. Uh, 12 months into the pandemic, inflation was about 1.5%. Okay, fine. It was about 2.0 to 2.75 prior to the pandemic. But then we hit a low point of 1.5, and it shot up to 6.61. Okay, that's a lot of inflation, and that's happening really quick. All right. Kind of correlates to that M2. And then we look at total federal public debt. All right. 
$23 trillion prior to the pandemic, $31 trillion today. That's a bunch, up 52%. So how high will interest rates go? That's something I think about a lot. Uh, we're gonna go to, the problem is I'm old. I was young and impressionable in 1983. <laughs> I remember I was in night school in 1983. It was one of those things where you work all day at the bank and then you go to Cal State and you drink a lot of coffee to try to stay awake long enough to get to 10 o'clock when this class is over. But uh, so you'd, you'd take a break and you'd go out and, and they had this coffee machine that had a cup that had playing cards on it, you know. <laughs> For a quarter, you could get something that was 99% caffeine. Right? That was the way to go. But uh, so we're standing around talking, and it's a group of guys. And, and one of the guys said, uh, "So this past weekend, my wife and I went out and we made an offer. We bought a house. Good for you. That's terrific. Wow! Congratulations. Where is it? You know? Oh, it's on the corner of X and Y. And you know, oh, I, that project. That's a nice project." Oh, terrific, right? How much do you pay? What do you get? How many bedrooms? <laughs> One of the guys says, so were you pre-qualified for your financing? The guy says, we got locked in at 17%. <laughs> Everybody said, that's good. 17% 30-year fixed home rate mortgage. Oh, Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> yeah. I guess it was the coffee. I remember it clearly. <laughs> I had hair. Life was good. I wish I would have got that. <laughs> that guy got locked in at 17. Yeah. Today, you know, for a while you wouldn't take a credit card at 17. No. So, so the question is, are we going to go back there? Yeah. Let's see. One of the problems is what's called the real rate of interest, or the real rate of return, or the real cost of financing. And what real refers to there is not tangible. Real refers to after inflation. Okay. So, for example, if the current rate of inflation is 6.4%, and that's where it is, most recently published numbers, the most recently published numbers for the average 30-year rate, 30 fixed-rate mortgage in the United States, 6.27. Okay, that's the average. Then if you risk, or rather tax adjust that rate, meaning you take it down based upon your deduction on your income taxes, the net effective rate on that is about 4.07%. Okay. So I, my net cost is 4.07, inflation is increasing this asset about 6.4, that means my cost of financing this is a minus 2.3. Dude, those are real numbers by the way, as of today. So unfortunately we've been doing this for quite a while. We've had a rate of inflation for a number of years in the 2.5% range and we had a less than 1% interest rate, which is tax deductible. So we had a low real rate of return, which again stimulates inflation. Financing creates inflation, unfortunately. So in this example, there is a negative cost of financing in this, and what it does is it induces borrowers to do that. And they tend to do too much of that. So the question is, what, well, what's a fair rate? What's a good rate? What should, how should this darn thing work? Well, you should take your core CPI. You should add to that about 2%. So you got to take your CPI and you got to put something about it, right? Otherwise, it's not interest. If my interest rate is 6.4 and my inflation is 6.4, it means my net effective rate is zero. So I should put about 2% over the rate of inflation. Okay. And then I should tax adjust that interest rate by 35%. That's the average personal income tax rate. Of course, it's bracketed. It depends on which rate you're in. If you're a corporation or if you're an individual, etc. But let's just use 35% as a, a, an example, rule of thumb here. Your interest rate should be 12.9%. 
problem is I've been beaten into a 1% environment way of thinking about things, and you might as well say 129%. That's a lot of money right there. So let's look at it backward and say, all right, 12.9%, you're crazy, Dan. But we tax adjust it by 35%, meaning we take off 35%, it's 8.4%. Oh, that's a familiar number. Inflation is at 6.4. That means there's a 2.0% real rate of interest in that equation. So what is the appropriate interest rate given this? It's about 12.92 before we adjust for risk. Auto loans should be higher than that, unsecured personal loans should be higher than that, etc. So 12.9, that, that sounds like a lot. Man, that's it is a lot. This doesn't yeah. sound like it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking to a whole room full of borrowers here. Yeah. Got it. I hope he doesn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to say I'm just showing the math, guys. So, have we ever done this before? I mean, am I just crazy here? All right, here we go. This is back when Dan had air. I was in high school right there. I graduated in 76. That was a good year. Made a Vega. The Vega and the Pinto. They were the worst. <laughs> but it was a blessing. I got really good at working on cars. <laughs> Javelin, yeah. Oh, the Gremlin. American Motors Gremlin. Boy, that has a look. American Motors could love. How many? Who did? Who got a Gremlin? Anybody? Oh, we got a Gremlin. Oh, we got a Gremlin over here. Oh, mother-in-law. Okay, brother. Brother-in-law. Okay. This is part next to it. We push that. <laughs> How many have Pintos? You know, if you had that Pinto today, it's worth some money. I guess all the rest of them blow up. <laughs> See, you, you did a couple of things there. We said Pinto, drive-in theater, and that, you know, none of that happens anymore. So. Yeah. Certainly, age you when you know you're talking about. <laughs> I used to know what he was talking about. <laughs> so, if we go all the way back uh, again, this goes to about uh, 1965. Uh, and we can see 1983, that's when I was having that conversation, and inflation hit 18% at that time. Okay. Now then, leading up to this period of time, there was some changeover in leadership politically and at the Federal Reserve, and the Fed believed that we could fine-tune the economy by managing M1 and M2. It used to come out every week, Walter Cronkite would talk about M1 and M2 and that sort of thing, and they kept diddling with this thing. But what they didn't do is they didn't raise interest rates in a time when inflation was getting out of control. Finally, a fellow named Paul Volcker took over as the Federal Reserve Chairman, and Paul's a tough guy, he's about six foot five. And uh, interest rates went up in that case to 22%. So when I say something like a 12.9%, and it sounds dramatic and horrendous and horrible, I remember what 22 sounded like at the time. Yeah. Right, at 25, on, Ooh, a, on a building loan, uh, oh. construction loan, oh. with Lloyd's Bank. Oh, oh, jeez. Oh. Yes. It went from 6% to 25% in like a month and a half. Wow. Um, wow. Yes. Lucky you're still here. <laughs> yeah. They had a heart attack. <laughs> and, and Luckily, we were making enough money we could pay it. <laughs> well, and, and it was interesting because we were in a high inflationary environment. Rates were going up so fast. I remember I went to one particular seminar and they were saying, don't pay your property taxes. Take that money and invest it. And you'll get a better rate of return and then you can pay the penalty at the end. Okay. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. So, so we've done this before. We And by the way, it worked. Paul Volcker's strategy worked. And it was not without pain and controversy, but it did work. And then eventually started coming down the other side. And by the way, these gray bars are period of recession. Okay? 
And we can see that the Federal Reserve raises rates and then there's recession. They raise rates and there's recession. They do it, you know, a bunch of times. I've got the same chart in a, a little different form, but you notice one thing about this? And these are real numbers, by the way. This is Federal Reserve numbers. What do we see going from 1983 all the way down to here? It's a general downward slope. Each time, we rose rates to a point where it broke and we had a recession, got lower than the time before. Well, why is that? Well, the real rate's the same. Inflation's lower. Inflation is lower. This is the CPI over that same period of time. Ah, notice something similar there? So you still rose rates, but inflation was lower and it broke the economy quicker. And so we didn't have that issue right up until now. That's a big one. So things, this is different. This isn't one more iteration of that. That's different. So the question is, are we going to go to a 12.9% interest rate? And that's right now at 6.4. Are we going to do that? Yeah. I think no. And the reason I think no is this. So this is federal debt to the public in, in general. So total federal debt. In 1983, we had $1.3 trillion in total federal debt. $1.3 trillion. Today, we've got $31.4 trillion. What do you think is going to happen to that debt at 22%? We can't possibly. We can't, we, can't, we can't get there at 12.9%. At and that's the problem. That's why we keep getting such a critical system here, why it breaks so fast, because we've got so much more debt. It reacts. Honestly, down here is like if, if I owed you $100 and you said, damn, I'm going to raise your interest rate to 22%, I'd say, all right, fine. Not the end of the world. It's 22 bucks. Okay, I can live with that. If I owe you a hundred million and you raise it by two basis points, I'm wrecked. So volume matters in this case. And that's why I don't see us doing that. There's another issue here. And this one is kind of interesting. It's really important, but I don't see much discussion about this. You know, the press is kind of, I don't even know who's in the press. I really wish Walter Cronkite would come back here. That's the way it was. Skip their lips or movie? Yeah. That's where you yeah. go. You know, it seems like it's all propaganda. And uh, you got the red team and the blue team. Each one's spewing their propaganda as to why their guy's a good guy and the other guy's a bad guy. And then we're, there's important stuff here that we're missing. And I don't know how we do that. I, I used to think NPR was, you know, fair. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. All right, enough of that ranting. So the U.S. dollar. Um, what about the U.S. dollar? Why is it so important? Why is it such a big deal? Well, keep in mind the U.S. dollar was originally a, a sovereign backed by precious metal, gold. Right? Okay, fine, good. Um, originally gold backed, that means it's not what's called a fiat currency. There's something anchoring it. It has a, a real life tangible value tied to something else, not just tied to because we said so. Okay, fine. World War II. Uh, the world's economies were shot, you know, uh, all of Europe, of course, <coughs> North Africa, and everybody. I mean, they were in bad shape. And so there was what was called the Bretton Woods Accord, uh, and that was down in the south. There was a camp called Bretton Woods, and they got together, and 44 countries were represented. They said, okay, guys, this is where we're going to do this. And uh, they said, now, the U.S., you've got a dollar, and it's backed by gold, so we're going to link all our currencies to yours. Dude, good. And so what came out of the Bretton Woods Accord was number one, the reaffirmation of the U.S. dollar being supported by gold, and that all of these other countries tying their currency to the U.S. dollar, which inherently made the U.S. dollar their reserve currency. And by the way, when I talk about all of this monetary expansion going on, more than half of it is international. It's not domestic. It's not here in the United States. It goes to the Central Bank of Kuwait. Where so, World War II, the Bretton Woods Accords come, the gold standard is in place, everything's good, off we go. 
1972, Richard Nixon temporarily suspended the gold standard. Of course, income tax was also temporary. Um, and the reason was we couldn't keep up with the, the gold required. We were expanding the monetary supply so fast we couldn't buy enough gold. And the price was going crazy. $35 a troy ounce, we couldn't buy enough. And so he abandoned the gold standard in 72, and it's been abandoned ever since. And roughly half of the currency currently is outside of the United States, as I just mentioned. All right, well, that's kind of interesting. That's novel, so who cares? Well, who cares is some things have happened. Well, number one, fiat currency. Uh, there have been, I don't remember the number, something like 500 fiat currencies over the years, uh, going back to the... Romans and I don't know, everybody tried it. The Chinese actually a thousand years ago were the first ones to try fiat currency of just printing a dollar bill and saying it's because I said so. And it didn't work. Uh, but then we keep trying. Yeah. So fiat currency is not backed by a commodity and it has no basic intrinsic value. And that's what leads to its decline. There's no intrinsic value. So at the same time, uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago, something like that, the Russians decided that Ukraine really did belong to them, and they decided to move some tanks in and, and uh, help out the Ukrainians. And uh, the U.S. was upset about that, as we should have been, and they imposed sanctions against the Russians. But there's only so much you can do. We didn't want to send our own tanks or people in there, so we said, you Russians, you sell a lot of oil. You can't settle through the U.S. Federal Reserve SWIFT system. That's a big deal. So essentially, we said, you can't trade with our currency. Well, the problem is the whole world wants Russian oil. And they're willing to do all kinds of They'll trade sheep for this stuff if they have to. <laughs> and they are. How many people have heard about the BRICS? BRICS, it's a consortium of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These guys here, what could possibly go wrong with you? They're nice. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this consortium was developed in 2000. It's not a brand new thing. It's been kind of sitting there. So the West has what they call the G7. And the BRICS is over here. Now, by the way, recently we got some folks that want to join the band. Saudi Arabia, Algeria, Argentina, Mexico, Nigeria. Oh. That's not good. And the BRICS now are saying we want to produce a gold-backed sovereign dollar or currency. Goodbye for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Darn it. So we told the Russians they couldn't use our dollars, and they said, fine, we'll invent some backed by gold. And, and a did lot the value of their currency go up after that? Yeah, and, and the price of Russian oil went through the roof. It was the nicest thing we could do to them. Yeah, really. This is a big That's deal. Stupid. This is a big deal. And the reason I say it's a big deal, and how it ties into everything else I've talked about, is if those dollars begin to repatriate back to the U.S., we get into a hyperinflationary trend. Right. Because now... Again, if only half of the currency is here and it comes back, it means we doubled the currency. Oh, shoot. So the thing that used to cost a buck now costs two bucks. Oh, that's bad. So, but nobody's talking about the bricks. Uh, in my mind, this is a big deal. It's a super big deal. So this is the part where I go out on a limb and I make a forecast. Um, you know, I, I look at a lot of Economist and you know, they hedge their bets. Well, on one hand, it could be this way, and on the other hand, it could be that. Yeah. Yeah. That is a way to wiggle it out of it. Well, I'll, I'll throw out an idea here. So I think the Fed is going to try to increase interest rates one or two more times. Probably 25 bips per, and it ain't going to go well. I think it'll ultimately fail, and then they'll pause, and they'll pause, and they'll pause, and they'll pause. And they'll pause. With the expansion of BRICS, I, I would watch for BRICS denominated or alternative currency denominated oil transactions. If we start to see an uptick in, in other denominated transactions, it means dollar 
de-dollarization is real and it's starting to happen. That means those dollars are repatriated back here and we're going to get into a hyperinflation. I look for an event. The Federal Reserve likes to say we're apolitical. We, we don't have a side. Oh, Loney. They do have a side. Janet is about as Democrat as you can get. She really is. She was in uh, Bill Clinton's uh, economic, Europe economic advisors. Of course, you know, Treasury and everything else. Anyway, whatever. I don't want to get off on that, but they're very political. And what they'll need is a backdrop. Remember when we saw the, the pandemic hit? That was the, first, the best event. We can crank the monetary supply by $5.7 trillion. Nobody will notice. I'm done. We'll look for another event. And that event will be a basis to drop interest rates from wherever they are at that point to zero. And that event could be, I don't know, the final finishing off of the Ukraine. It could be limited nuclear engagement. It could be somebody parks an aircraft carrier next to Taiwan. I don't know, North Koreans shoot somebody. Um, there'll be an event, and that event will cause the <coughs> drop because the Fed won't have another way to get out of this. When the Fed drops rate, they'll go into what's called a quantitative easing cycle, right? The first step is drop interest rates. The second is to increase monetary supply. At the same time, when we have de-dollarization, and that's when you start to get hyperinflation. Again, I, I Expect to see hyperinflation and de-dollarization. Hyperinflation, what kind of amounts? Is hyperinflation 100% every year? Is it 10%? Is it 30? What is hyper? I don't know. Yeah. Just get it down. Uh -huh. In your events, how about mishandling of debt ceiling negotiations? Would you consider that an event? I would consider that an event. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And that's almost predictable. <coughs> Will the Fed ever go away under all this? Will we have to go to another system? I'd like to think so. Um, believe it or not, even though I served on the Fed, and I think there are a lot of good things here, I don't like the unaccountability. I don't think unaccountability is... Well, we think they're part of the government in the United States. Well, they're absolutely part of the government. Yeah. Yeah. I thought they were independently uh, owned. I, I don't see that. Yeah. From I my, didn't understand that. From my perspective, they are very much partisan. Yeah. And we're starting to see that a lot. I mean, we're seeing the DOG and the FBI and the whole alphabet soup of different departments that have got particular agendas. Yeah. And, uh, uh, well, they, they have a vested self-interest. I mean, Luckily, they're wholesome and don't lie. No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. Real fortune. Did you, did, you, did, you, did you hear about that? I did. I heard about Still paying it off. Excuse me, sir. Uh, the bricks. Uh, I heard about that and in the, in, in the um, hyperinflation coming back. Uh, some economists in the United States were saying that they might start developing our own central bank. Have you heard about that? That BRICS will have their own central bank. The BRICS consortium would start their own central bank? No, we were here. We try to, try a different, a, 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 a competitor to the Fed? Yes. Oh, I can't see that. You don't think so? Yeah, no, no, they won't. They won't, they won't let Bitcoin. Uh, by the way, they hate Bitcoin. Of course they do. Uh, <laughs> everything they don't want. Yeah. Uh, so, lose control. So, all right. So, with all that fun stuff in mind, how do I go to the next slide? There we go. So, all right. Let's just say that's the case. Let's say that we inflation continues, interest rates move up a little bit and then drop. How do we do that? How does that work? Well, I think the key thing is invest in means of production. By the way. This won't be the first country in the world ever to go through a hyperinflationary period. Germany, prior to World War II, went through a hyper 3,000% per year. It's a big thing. It got to be cheaper to burn currency in Germany than, than wood. Yes, yes, that's true. There was a story, I don't know if it's true or not, it's funny. A guy, they got to a point they had to pay their workers twice a day because <laughs> prices would go up during the day. And so a guy got paid in the morning at, or lunchtime and he he put his currency in a wheelbarrow and he went down to the baker's place and it wouldn't go in the door and so he 
and sat it here by the door and kind of stepped in the door and you know gave his order. And sure enough, he looks back, he's distracted, looks back, and his wheelbarrow is gone. And so he runs out on the sidewalk, and the money's all over the sidewalk. He dumped the money out and stole the wheelbarrow. That uh, was true. So, so there are examples of hyperinflation in the past. And what, what does well is fundamental things do well. It's not going to be pet rock that does well. It's going to be farmland. By the way, who's the biggest buyer of farmland? <laughs> yeah. Bill Gates. Yeah. 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 Those are two dumb guys. Yeah. They probably don't know what they're doing. Uh, factories. Factories that make things that are actually needed. Uh, real estate. I'm, you know, people, it's a good time to buy real estate. So back when I bought my house, I made the biggest financial risk in my lifetime and bought a house. Oh my gosh, am I ever going to survive this? I look back now, my big mistake was I didn't buy every house on the street. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally, and again, if you're in a rapidly rising environment, inflationary rate, the cost of a two before is going to go up, hence the cost of a house is going to go up because the fundamental components of it are going to go up, plus the labor, plus the real estate, plus everything else. So I like real estate. Watch cash flow. This, it, it's not a toy. It's real. We've got to cash flow this thing. And so uh, am I saying now's a good time to go out by that $1.89 million personal estate? I don't think that's ever the time, but I'm cheap. So anyway, if it cash flows, do it. <laughs> well, if it cash flows, but if you just got to live in it, you know, do what Get Warren, do what Warren Buffett would do. Yeah. Live cheap. Uh, producers of basic products. You know, Warren Buffett. One of his favorite stocks is Coca-Cola. Can we live without Coca-Cola? Sure, we can. But you can buy it. Man. You can make it money. You keep going on to there. So. When I talk about these things, I don't mean you actually buy a factory, but you may buy equity in a company that operates a business, that manufactures, manufactures something that the economy needs. Diapers or paint or something that the economy needs and is run by good, competent people. And if you've got the means of production, if you've bought the means of production, those Prices, yeah, inflation will go up, and the price of paint goes up, and the profit goes up, and everything goes up in lockstep, and you'll continue to rise with that particular time. Watch dollar-denominated income, okay? What you don't want to do is to make a contract and say, oh, well, I'm going to do this particular thing, and I'm going to get paid uh, 100 per year for the next 20 years because that 100 per year is going to decrease in value. I remember I was 16 years old. I was sitting on my sister's porch swing, thinking deep thoughts about the economy even back then. And the economy as I knew it was if I could only make $300 a month, <laughs> I, I would have it made. I you would have. And you would have. And I would have. I would have. I could have just lived large. Today, $300 might fill my tank. I'm not certain. So watch dollar-denominated income because the value of that dollar will decrease. Oh, yeah, and uh, covering things that, you know, for the future, farms, factories, real estate. The one thing this country's not doing is producing now. Sure. We don't have oil. Sure. Uh, if, we, if we're not producing things, there's no interest in this country. Well, the reason we're not producing is not because we don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got oil. Yep. We've got oil reserves. We mm -hmm. were oil independent not long ago. Mm -hmm. We're on top of oil. I don't want to beat up the current resident of the White House. Yeah. <laughs> However, <laughs> However Trump oh, said, now. bring it back this, to America. This is a policy yeah. thing that we're dealing with. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> but our economy has changed to be so much more services based than it was the last time we had a recession like this or, or you know we were in this sort of a situation you know yeah we like Owen said I hate to say he's right by the way but <laughs> um, did you we get do, that? 
You know, I said I hated to say it. You know, we produce so much less here. You know, my in, in my own business, my mix of product to services has changed radically. I, I imagine you could go out and buy a, a server that was manufactured in the United States, or a monitor, or sure, sure I could, or a router, or that, a, no, no, I can't. <laughs> you can't because of I that. I cannot. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, it, in my opinion, I want the best I can do. It is going to be tough, 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 for us to begin to produce things because number one, to get the land and get the building and do everything that needs to be done. You know, there are two semiconductor plants going up, one in Texas and one in Arizona, to the tune of $16 billion? And they can't build it fast enough. And they can't build it fast enough. And luckily, there's a lot of regulations, though, to make sure it's being done right. <laughs> you know, I think uh, the environment <laughs> and equity and inclusion is probably the solution to all our problems. <laughs> By the way, Mary Daly is the current president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank, who is the primary regulator over Silicon Valley Bank. And Mary Daly gave 91 presentations in the last year on the environment. <laughs> Aren't we grateful? <laughs> What's your take on uh, gold? Uh, sure, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> right here because it's pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, uh, so historically speaking, gold, you know, went from $35 an ounce up to uh, $1,500 an ounce, and then it came back down, and it's kind of been bouncing around a little bit. So, um, uh, and currently around 2000 something like that, I haven't looked in the last couple of days. So, if you were to look back and say, had I bought gold over the past few years, would I have done well? The answer is no, I wouldn't have. Looking forward, is it a stable currency to preserve value? Maybe. Um, uh, I like physical gold. I'm not crazy about virtual gold. Gold contracts, forwards, that sort of thing. I don't understand gold mining. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of different variations on gold. Um, I guess for me at least, I'm not an expert in gold, but over the past 10 years, you wouldn't have kept up with inflation. So if the dollar devaluated, would the gold still devaluate with the dollar? If, if you know, that's the weird thing. So right now, who's the biggest buyer of gold? Well, Turkey is the biggest buyer of gold today. Uh, Russia, Singapore, a bunch of countries that are dealing with sovereign debt issues are buying gold. Uh, the price is moving up. The U.S. Federal Reserve is buying gold. Russia is buying gold. The Chinese are buying gold. Um, so one would expect the, the price to begin to move higher because of so much demand for the, the raw product. Um, I, you know, I, I don't know. I guess I just really can't give you advice on that. I'm, I'll, I'll punt on that one. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about commercial then? Commercial. You know, all the talk commercial, commercial buildings. Ah, yeah. Yes. Right. Lots of noise going on out there. With, Lots of noise. Uh, the banks are getting a little nervous on it. Right. Yeah. Uh, they're not in trouble yet. Over it. Yep. It, uh, it could tip that direction. Commercial real estate could be very volatile. And uh, depending on location and access and age and ceiling height and zoning and community and a lot of variables there. Um, and it, it's really tough. Uh, you know, everything that's not a house is commercial real estate. Uh, if it's a church or if it's a hotel, it's commercial real estate. So it's such a broad thing to try to summarize all in one piece. I think we can all agree there's going to be less office space used over the near term than there was. Uh, as I understand it, at least, um, office space in Walnut Creek across the bay is currently leasing for more than office space in the city of San Francisco. Smart people. Which at one time was the highest priced office space in California. Old West Coast. So uh, things change. Um, you know, if, if 
we'd have talked about office investment five years ago, we might have talked about San Francisco kind of favorably. Uh, today, not so much. Today, it's rough. So, you know, back to the commercial real estate in general, it all depends. Um, you know, multifamily is, is one, in my opinion, might have been oversold. I've seen appraisals on apartments. I saw loans made on appraisals on apartments based on a 3.5% cap rate. 3.5% cap rate, if you reprice that at a 10% cap rate, it's worth a third. And so... Default rate gone up on it? Not yet. Not yet. Not, not a meaningful move. Credit hasn't proven to be an issue so far. <laughs> Zones have not been, have not really panned out that well. Good idea. <laughs> yeah, it just hasn't worked out yet. So, um, I think the key thing is don't don't panic on anything. I mean, if you've got commercial real estate, don't sell cheap and get out. If you own residential real estate, don't panic and sell. Don't don't do anything out of fear. Um, cool heads will always prevail. Uh, in time. One of the smartest guys I ever saw was right in the middle of the great pandemic, or the 2008 Great Recession. Um, he had enough cash and enough foresight to go in and buy Bank of America ORIO. B of A was foreclosing right and left, and he was buying right and left. He bought 125 houses at an average price of $60,000 each. Turned out okay. And there were a lot of folks that said, oh, that's a gutsy move. They could go to 40. They did. They went on. So it was a good move for him, and he had the ability to do it. And I didn't. That's why I'm here. So <laughs> <laughs> anyway, watch dollar denominated income, because if the value goes down, uh, you won't you fully realize it. What does that mean exactly? Didn't you say, that's only long, like, I get a contract it's going to run me 20 years and I'm getting the income think, from it, that's when I'm going to get waxed. Right? Think of annuity. Yeah. I buy an annuity that's going to pay me $1,000 uh, a month and I'm going to live on that, or $300 a month uh, when I was 16, <laughs> I'm going to be set. So the problem is $300 a month. Social Security. Social Security is going to be tough. It's really going to be tough because the federal government <coughs> won't be able to keep up those cost of living adjustments fast enough. It's going to Gonna hurt you. Hey Dan, what about solar? Yeah, yeah, solar. Solar? Everything's you know, going to solar now. That's right. A lot of everybody, every, those countries going to solar. They're moving us their solar, getting rid of the oil. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, Ponzi scheme. Um, now, and, and by the way, I spent $360,000 on solar on this bill, and I still get to pay Edison $48,000 a year for the privilege of the ground. Um, yeah, what about, yeah. Yeah. what about, what oh, about, where's the Alexa? So, you know, solar is, uh, I'm always nervous about things swinging too far. And uh, uh, it's like no internal combustion engine cars by 2035, okay? Good luck with that. Uh, we've already had periods of time where we were discouraged from charging electric vehicles because of constraint of the grid. Uh, that won't get better with more electric vehicles. It will only get worse. No. Mm -hmm. The challenge with solar is it only works half of the time because half of the time it's dark. Um, maybe you could put out a street lights. That works. No, okay. Um, the math works in solar. The reason I spent $360,000 on this, this guy got $180,000 right back in tax credits. Without those tax credits, this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at the end of the day, is solar, yeah, it's fine, whatever. I don't get too twisted up over the environment, honestly. I think it's a lot of foolishness. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, the people in the Ukraine don't worry about the environment. Or China. I have a question. Okay. Um, it's very interesting to hear what's going on in the world today. 
it's after seven and I have horses I have to feed. Okay. What I came tonight for was to find out what our bank is going to do about what's coming at us. And okay. I know I'm probably preempting something, but I kind of no, like to really. hear it before no. I leave. I wasn't going to touch that. <laughs> 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 no one was supposed uh, to ask that question. I know. Uh, been too long in a male-dominated arena. Okay. You, you know, this is sure. <laughs> she really has cherry out of body, and if you need your car worked on, she's a good one. And, uh, Thank you. And one thing about Shirley, she will tell you exactly what she's thinking. <laughs> and. Uh, even if you don't want to hear it, right? <laughs> it saves a lot of time. Yeah, I'll tell you, it fit right, in, horses. In, right <laughs> in my family. Yeah. So, all right, let me get to the last slide here. Uh, preferred dollar denominated expenses. Yeah. You don't want to fix income by dollars, but you do want to fix expenses by dollars, if you can. Most people have got to be smart enough not to do that. And then prefer assets over cash. Cash will decrease in value, assets will increase in value. The trick is going to be which assets are we talking about? So with that, Shirley's question, what about our bank? What are we doing? Well, I'm glad you asked, honestly. So our bank has 55% loan to deposit ratio. At the end of the last quarter, we had zero delinquency. Uh, zero in terms of collections, zero. Well, I do have one foreclosure. <laughs> But it's been charged off, so it doesn't show up on anything. $62,000, I think it was, uh, on a house in the Salton Sea. So if you're interested in a house, I'll give you a deal. my assets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Praise for 280, we'll make you a deal. <laughs> Actually, I'm just kidding on that one. He made his payments and he's in good shape. So uh, I can't even sell a house in Salton Sea anymore. Um, so in terms of credit quality, we're in good shape. Uh, we don't have any problem assets I'm worried about, but I'm a paid professional worrier, so I do that a lot. So I'll send Glenn emails and say, what about a particular credit, and then he sends me an email back and says he just made the payments hot dog. You know? yeah. <laughs> so a lot of that goes on. Uh, we spend a lot of time, we're, we're small enough, when you talk about the Smith loan, we all know who we're talking about, because we don't have that many loans, and we can hopefully keep an eye on them. We've gone through some tough times before, so hopefully this won't be as tough, but hopefully we learned something last time, and that is get out in front of them, get out early. <coughs> Um, if you detect a problem, you get with your borrower, work it out if you can, be proactive. Don't ignore it or it's going to bite you. So, 55% loan to deposit ratio. I did mention we got five or six PPP loans still in the books, but those dumb things. Anyway, they're going to stay there forever, but not very many of them. Uh, we have got, uh, at the end of the quarter, we had $79 million in cash. Uh, we've got 200 million in credit available, so we've got 325 million in deposits and about 250 million in cash and lines of credit. So, 272 million in lines of credit. So, Lord willing, um, you know, I do things like watch these guys and say, <laughs> "How do we compare?" Uh, to make sure we're prepared for. Do so, you have a chart similar to that chart you showed us to show all this bank does it pass us 10% a year, 90% there? I do. Yeah. Should you get around to that? Yeah. yeah. Good. Two questions. I have heard from two sources, one of which is Five Star uh, REO, that the units are going to be coming, are being foreclosed on. It's going to be a array of of those. Have you heard that? No. No, I haven't. Um, and I would be cautious about, you know, last time there were these rumors about things, uh, off balance sheet foreclosures that are going to be released, and, you know, we're always going to wait for this big surge of things that didn't happen. Um, I, I'm not aware of anything like that. Um, now, having said all of that, uh, Delinquency on credit cards is rising. Um, not out of control, but it is rising. You know, we're, we're starting to run. Uh, consumer credit is starting. Consumer credit defaults and delinquency is beginning to increase. Um, auto loans are going to be challenging. Um, 
you know, as car sales slow down and trading values get soft and that sort of thing, there's no way for folks to exit on a car loan. Um, so I would see some softness there. Um, fortunately, in our case, most of our loans are commercial real estate loans. The majority, our average is 47% loan deposit ratio. And our average maturity to reprice, or the time in which the interest rate is set to change, is 2.7 years. So we're not out too far. And that, that's an important number. Um, so relatively short, relatively conservative. You know, for us, it's it's a whole different game than it is for B of A. Yep. You know, it's, I, I'm really glad that I can sit down with folks in our community and talk about these things and kick it around and get everyone's input. I, I don't think B of A can do that. Uh, so we're, we're fortunate that yeah. But if interest rates continue to rise, as I think they might, uh, there are going to be challenges, and there'll be headlines, and there'll be all kinds of scary things. And uh, I don't know, we might have to get together once every quarter and just you know, eat chicken, commiserate. Um, I'll tell you what's going on to the best I can. Shirley, did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. I did expect to see one of those little charts, though. Oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I second his notion. Uh, okay. That's okay, I can, I can live with just your, your word. <laughs> so we got an annual report, it was mailed today. And a report to shareholders went out there. So if you have to be a shareholder, you get it in the mail in the next, oh, I don't know, as soon as the postman gets there, along with your proxy notice and all of that detail. Annual shareholders meeting is scheduled for May 25th. It's a Thursday. And we're going to have it here at the branch again. We had it for many years at Los Serrano's Country Club. But unfortunately, timing was such they didn't have that date available. And modernly live streaming our meeting has got to be very important. Um, we've got shareholders in other areas and other states, and joining virtually is an important component. And Los Serranos doesn't have enough bandwidth in their internet connectivity to allow us to do that. So, anyway, we're going to be here. Uh, we'll be serving uh, the leftover chicken, <laughs> <laughs> vegetables. Anyhow, uh, if you are a shareholder, and even if you're not a shareholder, if you're a, a customer or a friend, feel free to come. And uh, I'll be reusing these slides, because I already did them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there'll be lots of charts about our bank. Uh, Open yeah. bar, Dan. Pardon me? Open bar. Open bar, <laughs> yes, yes. Except no red. No red, no, we can't. We, we can do white wine, but not red wine. No. <laughs> 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 and, uh, I had a request last year, somebody wanted a margarita. I guess when we have our, our chamber mixers, we would serve margaritas so without the telewine. So yeah. where's the margarita? <laughs> All right, good. Yes, ma'am. We're looking forward to sit, uh, hearing you on Friday. You're one of our favorite speakers with the West End Real Estate Professor. You've already heard it. You <laughs> 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 the things that you said the last time no that you were there that I think really resonated with a lot of real estate agents is that you can make money in any market. And that was really, I saw the relief on people's faces when you said that. So. Well, like I said, this, this individual I was talking about earlier, the amount of money that he made in that period of time, which arguably was one of the worst economic periods we had, that's what gave him the opportunity to buy these houses very cheap. But he had to have enough cash and enough guts to be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. And staying power. And staying power, really, yes. Mm -hmm. But as you know, Kenny Rogers so wisely <coughs> said, through his gambler, <laughs> every hand's a good one, and every hand's a bad one. <laughs> you gotta know when to run. Yes, yes, yeah. Just, uh, well, you know, uh, I guess part of getting old uh, is that we've seen this before. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And we've seen cycles, and we've seen good times, and we've seen bad times, and we've seen successes, and seen some mistakes made, and that kind of thing. And it kind of rounds you out a little bit. Uh, maybe don't go so far out on that branch as I used to go when I was young. Uh, a little more conservatively. Uh, don't get quite so upset when things start to go sideways. Uh, let it play out. And um, uh, yeah, I'm, 
not so sure about the politicians, you know? Uh, I, I'm sour on politicians right now. I feel like they're, they're the D minus students in the class. Mm -hmm. and, you give them a lot of credit, they don't deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> Sorry. But they like, they like the attention, they like the power, they like to be in the spotlight, and uh, well, good for them, whatever, but let's not keep looking to them for the solution, because I think in many cases, they are the author of the problem, mm -hmm. and uh, to look to them again as the solution is a little misguided. I think the solution's right here. It's, it's everybody here. You know what the head of the mafia in Chicago during the 30s and 40s said? His easiest bribe for the politicians. <laughs> Took a little more hassle to get the judges and so forth. But okay. the politicians, they were like dime a dozen. <laughs> a lot of good people to go to the politics and change their ways. Well, yeah. Yeah. it's very tempting. Yes, yes, yeah. So that is my present. Any other questions? Thank you, Dan. You really did. Yes. Yeah, appreciate yes, it. Yes, thank you, Dan. Yes. Yes. And thank you for learning it with wisdom. And even, you know, when you said your uh, loans were up, you oh. repricing up to 2.7 years on average, that means they're laddered, right? So if you needed to reprice them every month more, you would reprice them as you go, which also takes the sting out of it, right? Right. That's right. Well, you're good about that loan. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Normally dependable, but in this environment, So my friend Eddie Sumar is back here. Eddie just got back from Africa, in which he was taking an educational program of entrepreneurialism and living your dream to African students. Wow. Good work, Eddie. Go, Eddie. Yes. I don't know if you're going to get paid a lot in this life, but in the next one. <laughs> That's what counts. All right, guys, with that, thank you. Good thank night. you, Dan. I'll be around tomorrow. Thank you.